One of the most exciting times in, in chess is when there's a world championship match going on. I mean, that's the pinnacle of chess, to see the very, very best in the world uh, playing. And back in the day, uh, the matches used to be 24 games long. Really rather unique in the sports. I mean, you have a seven game, you know, series. Uh, that lasted a lot, but, you know, a 24 game match often went a month and a half. I mean, and it was like really front page news. Now it's like, okay, they'll just play a 12 game match, the first to six and a half of points. I mean, these guys got it easy. There's no marathon, there's no challenge in that. And winning a game in a short match is really huge. Okay. Last year, in 2014, uh, Magnus Carlsen, defending champion, was playing against Viswanathan Anand, Vishy, uh, whom he had taken the title from. So in a sense, this was their second match for the World Championship, a revenge or a rematch, but uh, Anand definitely qualified and was the des deserving opponent. Okay, in this game, uh, Magnus Carlsen was white and opened e4. We see e5, knight f3, knight c6. Dare I say, probably the, the oldest position so far in chess. And now we might deb debate whether this move, bishop b5, is the oldest move. Uh, that move, bishop b5, of course, bears the name of uh, the Spanish uh, priest, Lopez, and uh, it's called the Rui Lopez. Bishop c4, bringing the bishop out in order to be able to attack f7, I think might be older than the Rui Lopez. Something tells me that in the old uh, swashbuckling days, what is called the Italian opening, or the Italian br bishop, developing the bishop to c4 might actually be the oldest. But bishop b5 is certainly uh, the choice of modern day grandmasters. I shouldn't say that as an absolute because I do recall, of course, that in their fantastic five world championship match clashes, Gary Kasparov had to rely, had to fall back on the Scotch defense. And, and, and also the Scots, the Scotch, Scotch uh, opening, the Scotch opening, why did I say defense? Uh, it's certainly uh, one of the oldest as well. Bishop b5, and today, it's funny, in, in 1850, Paul Morphy introduced a7, a6, which became the rage for the next 165 years. Everybody and his brother is playing a7, a6. Before that time, they had played this move knight f6. And, um, Today, it's the single most popular defense uh, to the king pawn opening. Knight f6, ca oh, sorry, just a second, cancel, sorry. Uh, castles, sorry, just a second, new variation, is considered the most challenging, and then we get into what is called the Berlin defense, yeah, or the Berlin Wall more accurately. And these two players have played both sides of that. Yeah, Alex. I don't mean to no, please, please, please. But, you know, for a while, like 2005 to like 2010, it seemed like the Schliemann really like became very popular and then just completely disappeared. Right. Is there any insight? Yeah. Well, F7, F5 is, this is the one you mean, right? Yeah. And it was like Timur Rajabov was leading the charge and playing it. And it's it's very interesting gambit idea, and what they I think have well, been was showing us. Do you remember that? yeah uh, there's a very very long variation that goes from this position, and uh, Priya Darshan, for example, has been showing us uh, some analysis that had made, and it seems like with engines and, comp you know, and, and really well prepared, the patterns can un unfold another 15, 20 moves. And it seems like black was actually getting 
a poor position. That, uh, and, but I know what you mean. At one time it was like, and it's interesting how, how openings go in and out of fashion, right? One moment, you know, everybody's playing the night orf, like just everybody. And then the next thing, you know, it's the Sveshnikov. Right. And then everybody reverts back, of course, to the French defense or Karl Khan, you know, like, so these fashion trends like this. But uh, these days, the Berlin defense uh, has really captured the imagination of the world's top players. They're playing it. And finally, I think Magnus said, well, I'm not getting anything against the Berlin Wall. I'm just going to play d2, d3, defending my pawn on e4, go ahead. And black says, well, fine, you know, my bishop, I'll bring it out to a very active square, uh, control more uh, territory, space, white castles, very, very good, d7, d6, black puts further support for his e5 pawn. Rook to e1. OK, at this moment, there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, uh, White has a lot of different ideas. One idea is he can just bring his bishop here to e3, offering to trade. Another idea, c3, d4. Other ideas are knight d2, knight c4, bishop g5 or finally bishop g5, knight c3. So there's a lot of ideas here for white. Uh, rook e1 is one of those moves where I'm not a big fan of this move, quite frankly, but I, I appreciate that it's a real, really flexible. It's the type of move that can fit in with whatever setup white is looking for. Okay, black castle. So black already, in my opinion, has equalized. I mean, full stop. Uh, in time count, he's doing fine. In control of the center, he's doing fine. Safe king. So black's equalized. So this is the only thing that really attracted, as from what I can tell, that attracted Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, to uh, champion <laughs> White's position, is he's going to try to prove that these pawns, these double pawns on c7 and c6 are a little weak and that he can exploit them. Um, I would say that's a big ask. <laughs> All right, h2, h3. So already there's some issues for white. Like, let's say that white uh, plays a move for argument's sake, like knight b1, d2, just simply developing. Uh, white might have to. Oops, why didn't it want to do that? White might want to consider, wait a minute, hold on, just a second. Uh, I, I'm allowing my opponent an attack against the f2 pawn, and after, for example, a move like rook e2, not the only move, f7, f5, suddenly it is black who's going to take over the initiative here, and this rook on f8 is nicely looking down the f file. So the move h2, h3, oops, excuse me, is really a preventive move. It's a defensive move already, in a sense. White uses a whole tempo um, just to control the g4 square. OK, having said all of that, um, now it's up to black to try to figure out a plan for himself. Uh, what's he going to do with a slight squared bishop? Does he want to play for f5? Does he want to play for d5? Um, big questions. Uh, this move, rook uh, to e8, mm, it's, again, it's kind of like white's rook e1. Uh, I would try to argue, if I were in black shoes, that the rook actually stands well on f8. That on a very good day, if you could play the move f7, f5, I would want to keep the rook on e8. So I might, in my mind, come up with a scheme, a plan, in order to do that. So here, I thought that a very good move, for example, for black might be a move like bishop b6. OK, what's the idea of this move? We'll, we'll find out in a second. The idea is as soon as white uh, plays for c2, c3, I want to play c5. I want to stop this move d4. 
Now you might say to me, yes, sir, you're an idiot. What have you done to our bishop? You've blocked it in. Yes, I have, but it's not going to be blocked in forever. Do I have a position like this? Now, again, white could play for d4, and we could trade, and he'd have some space. Uh, but then his whole plan, which he initiated with bishop takes c6, which was to exploit my double pawns, you've traded them off. In the meanwhile, again, on a good day, what I really want to do is move this knight so that I can play f5. And I think black, let's just say that I would always agree to that position as black. I would always agree to that position. Rook e8, knight d2, knight d7. Now, this idea of knight d7, I understand I'm not really having to worry as white about any f5 ideas because you've already moved the rook. What I understand that Anon has in mind is he wants to move his knight to the f8 square and maybe the e8, e6 square so that he can jump to d4 or f4. Knight c4, bishop b6, uh-huh, you see, bishop b6. a2, a4, a7, a5. And we got here. And uh, Magnus really doesn't have a great idea. Black's perfectly fine, perfectly safe, perfectly solid. What is he supposed to do? And I think this is an important moment here, is this idea that the grandmasters today are so evenly matched. You know, there's got to be something that makes the world champion the world champion. I mean. Uh, Bodvinik said he was first amongst equals, yeah? And uh, that something is you just need some kind of a creative idea that the other guy doesn't see. Are you guys all familiar with this game, by the way? Yeah, good. So in this position, Magnus Carlsen comes up with a creative idea that I was very, very impressed by. Knight takes b6, pawn takes b6. Again, position's dead. I mean, it's as even as you could want it to be. Eight pawns versus eight pawns. Just a couple of pieces have been traded. What's worse from white's point of view is we have opposite color bishops, which means it's going to be very hard for white um, to create a favorable imbalance. d4, queen c7. Both players could easily have seen this position uh, forthcoming. And I'm sure in, Ma in Vichy's mind, it was sort of like, OK, easy day at the office. A draw is going to be agreed. Bang. Rook a1, a3. This is the creative idea that I was uh, talking about. In this position of absolutely nothing happening, you know, go to sleep, wake me up when you decide to create a threat. Suddenly this rook on a3 has this idea of jumping over to the king side. A moment ago, usually speaking, white's supposed to move his bishop, supposed to move his queen, supposed to bring his rook into play. But this idea of coming over rook a3 to g3 uh, gives uh, the position a little spark. Knight f8. OK. Uh, I don't think, just a second, let me just see. Yeah. I don't think that Vichy uh, Black uh, was really uh, fully mm, respectful, isn't the right word, was fully cognizant that there, there was, there are uh, issues for him in the position, and that maybe he should take a much more concrete approach. I thought that he, that is to say, black should have played the move c6, c5 here. Okay? So the idea of c5 is that in case of a captures on e5, knight captures e5. Although the move c5 has weakened the square d5, I've got the light squared bishop. 
I can defend that square. I can defend the square with bishop e7, bishop e6, and doing very well. On the other hand, if white were to play the move f5, knight f8, knight d2, in order to be able to bring his rook across, black is quick to play f5. In the game, he didn't have this resource. So I thought that there was a slight slip here, a slight slip with this move, knight f8, takes, takes, knight h4. OK, now it's starting to become clear. If we had white, and we had three moves in a row, we would bring our rook across. That would be move number one. We'd bring our queen to h5. That would be move number two. We'd bring our bishop to h6, putting pressure on the, on the pawn on g7. So now suddenly, and out of the blue, um, concrete crystal ideas of attacking for white are beginning to appear in the position. I like this move very much, rook d8. I thought that this was a very good move. The only open file in the position is a d file. As we know, the rooks belong on open files. So as white is turning his attention to concentrate on the king side, black says, OK, I'll take advantage of that strategically to um, improve my rook. Queen h5, f7, f6. The idea behind f6, of course, is, is several fold. Uh, to reinforce the uh, pawn on e5 and to potentially use the queen as a, as a defender against the pawn on g7. Knight f5, white, black moves his pieces into position. Bishop e6. Now this is the move that we really had problems with. Bishop e6. I didn't like that move one bit. I thought that first and foremost, I would like to get rid of the queen. If I was in black shoes, I would have certainly had queen f7 high on my uh, priority list of what moves to make. After, for example, uh, if the queen were to drop back to g4, with, by the way, a very important threat, knight, F, knight h6 check threat, takes, takes, rook to d4, and then I'm ready to put my rook on d8, and I'm fast. I'm just fast in terms of getting my development going. And I think black's position is simply fine. So queen f7 would have been my first choice. And then my second choice is getting that knight into the game. I didn't quite understand why Vichy didn't play knight e6. Uh, sorry, uh, here, knight e6, uh, rook g3, king h8. Okay, so I'm thinking that this knight is ready to bounce to either d4 or f4. And um, this, funnily enough, this rook could come across, rook a7, you could develop the rook like rook a7 and queen f7 to further fortify the king side. So the move bishop e6 I didn't like. Maybe after this move is when black gets into a bit of trouble. Rook g3, knight g6, h4. This is a nice moment <coughs> right here. In some ways, you can say both players are happy. White's built up some kind of attack, but black's defenses look really good. OK. So white needs to do more. This rook is fine. That rook is fine. The only piece that really isn't fine is this bishop on h6. And what white really wants to do is go bishop h6. When the bishop gets captured, to go queen takes h6, and with this knight in a pin, to grab that knight. So what this move h4 does is it sets up just that precise idea. 
to go bishop h6 takes takes and then with the with the move h4 h5 uh, to bust up black's king site so this move h4 is really uh, now forcing black to do something and Vichy he made a compromise I thought that this was uh, a definite uh, step in White's favor, giving up his bishop. I thought uh, in the game that he had to play the move rook d7, okay? Just defending along the uh, seventh rank, preparing rook d8, and maybe I understand at the moment the queen is defending, but it may be at some moment in the future to be able to shoot down here. Without question, Vichy was fearful or concerned, if you prefer, about the move bishop h6. Then after bishop takes, pawn takes, knight back, I saw a position like this that I'm putting on the board that I wasn't, I wasn't even, how is white going to break through on g7? I was looking at some position where, oops, I beg your pardon, uh, wrong, uh, wrong reach there. It's sort of like, you got to give White credit, right? He's put maximum firepower, one, two, three. He's maximized all he could do against the pawn on g7. But on the other hand, it's defended a lot of times as well. I didn't see how White would... Um, further improve the position. That didn't happen in the game, sorry. This happened in the game. Vichy played knight f4, takes, takes. And now we've got this position. And suddenly, and in a kind of an annoying way, the position has morphed into a, a moment where black is not happy. It's sort of like, the, the pawn structure almost looks identical, right? Okay, but the queen is more active than this queen, and this rook is certainly more active than that rook. And it's sort of like if you move your rook to, for example, d4 to defend this, you've got to be afraid of rook e8 check with a back rank checkmate. And suddenly, and in a very mm, sh subtle shift, it's like White's advantages start to become more and more clear. We can imagine that if it was White to move, White would love to play a move, for example, like queen f3, putting pressure on this pawn and this pawn, and following it up with rook c4. Black doesn't have any simple mechanism in which to counter White's slowly increasing pluses. Now again, you have to imagine that these are two of the world's greatest chess players, with not much difference between them. They're that close. And yet it's these little, small, tiny uh, nuances that uh, distinguish them. And from a position that was pretty dead even, uh, Magnus has been able to create, create something in his favor. c4, c5, rook slides up to e6, very, very nice outpost. So supported by the pawn, black really doesn't want to trade that rook and uh, give white a, a, a passer. But on the other hand, you don't want to live with a rook like that either. That rook is like a monster uh, in, on your side of the board. Rook b8. Okay, so here the idea uh, from Vichy was that he wants to get counterplay, to quickly get counterplay with b6, b5. But it may have been better for him to make Luft uh, with h7, h6. As we'll see in a moment, Black's king is about to get into trouble. Rook c4, again, one of those... I think Magnus, uh, Anatoly Karpov used to have a patent on his kind of moves. And he was really, really superb at making these small, tiny adjustments uh, to his position and uh, that improved his pieces 
and you didn't have the same mechanism that Anatoly had. So this is a really Anatoly Karpov type of move and it's also a Magnus Carlsen kind of move. It's that small little nettlesome move that does a little bit of good for him and it doesn't give you a lot of opportunity either. First of all, the rook just moves to a better square. In principle, white would love to double on the file so he could threaten checkmate with rook e8. Can't play rook to e3 because, of course, the pawn on f4 guards it. So you play rook to c4 in order to double the rooks, making that rook more effective by placing it here. And secondly, by putting it on e4, the pawn on f4 is hanging. At this point, everybody who was watching the game in real time kind of got the feeling that, whoa, uh, Vichy is in trouble, and then you have to go backwards and backwards and backwards and say, well, where did it all come from? Queen d7. Now, already, this is actually a kind of a, a bailout idea. Black is really looking for an opportunity, oops, excuse me, of playing queen d1 check in order to force the trade of, of queens and go into a four rook ending, even at the cost of a pawn, but if he could get an active rook, good drawing chances. So queen d1 is, an is a desire to bail out. White has no such intentions of allowing the queen trade. He moves his king away from the check. Okay, and let's see, sorry. Uh, rook f8. Already this threat of checkmate that constantly exists uh, over the position with rook e8 is becoming more and more bo bothersome and black can see he's about to lose a pawn. How many of you have lost to this type of a tactic, by the way? I've been victimized at least three times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The idea is you lead with your queen, so you offer the guy a trade of queens, and you're thinking to yourself, he takes my queen, I take his queen. And instead of being a sport and trading queens, your opponent hits you with a check, a check that you absolutely were sure you had protected because your rooks defend. The, but now you suddenly shock and realize that when you trade the rooks, <laughs> you end up losing the queen. I've lost three times like this, trust me. It's sort of like, ah! Oh, it's very, very painful. Rook f8, rook e4, and rook b7, uh, defending the 7. Uh, queen e2. Everything basically is going very, very nicely in Magnus's favor at this point. And I was not a fan of this move, queen e2. Um, in a sense, what I think white should do is, is kind of like, I don't know, uh, like absorb this pawn. You know, uh, the rooks, white's rooks are dominant. They just protect everything. And I think the most natural move for anybody would have been to play the move queen f3 with the idea simply to play queen takes f4, then play a move like b3, just settling everything on the queen side so that you're just a pawn up, and then slowly start thinking about what's your winning plan from there on out. I think the move queen e2 was actually based or designed on the idea to discourage black uh, from making this counterplay type of advance, b6, b5. But the reality is, is that if, if black makes this advance, all he does in truth is weaken his own structure. So rather than trying to discourage it, I allow it to happen. <laughs> b5, b3, takes, takes. Okay, so at least from Black's perspective, he's given his rook some uh, chances of getting into White's uh, position. The rook on b1 comes alive, and he plays the move rook b4. Rook e7, queen d6. Just a second, why didn't, there was a good, uh, clever reason. 
just a second. I have to remember <coughs> what that reason was. Okay, uh, this is a, a very cute idea. Uh, um, Magnus had ha offered his pawn on f5 as bait. Like, go ahead, take the pawn. It's all yours. Beware of grandmasters offering pawns. <laughs> okay, uh, they're not. They don't give up their pawns very uh, easily. Uh, do you see the reason why that was would have been a fatal uh, capture? Yeah, no, you see this. White would trade rooks. Let's say after recapture, check forcing the king into the corner. Now queen f7, right? Like Bobby Fischer's book, you know, Bobby Fischer teaches chess. The whole book was about back rank mates. <laughs> so Bobby's offering an example of the back rank mate. And obviously since this capture as well as this capture is fatal, we have to look at this defense. And now there's no there's no way to stave off checkmate. So the f5 pawn was poisonous. And the game went queen here. Now, but on the other hand, this one is a little bit of a dirty move, right? Because you're setting up for f4, f3 with a discovered check against the king on h2. You've got to be careful about that. And the queen went back to f3. So remember that little stutter step thing that Magnus did with his queen coming to e2 and then returning to f3? Well, he would have been a tempo uh, to the good had he just played the queen f3 once. That's basically the only criticism I'll ever give about Magnus's game, this game. I think he played an absolutely beautiful game from here on out. Rook takes, queen takes, okay. Again, it's like this comparative uh, com comparison you have to make. The qualitative difference between the queen, white's queen and rook versus black's queen and rook. White's is much better. F3 check, king here. And this is where Vichy uh, certainly missed his um, chance or opportunity to save it. He has played h7, h5. And it's, it's like that move is born of this desire to get out of those back rank mates and the fact that he's been under pressure the whole game. Like, uh, where do mistakes come from? Well, <laughs> put pressure on your opponent. Keep giving him one problem after another after another to solve, and soon he won't be able to solve them all. So at the moment that uh, this move h7, h5 was played, I was watching this, uh, I, I was online on the official website, and there were two commentators. And it was a, a lady and Peter Swidler, Grandmaster Peter Swidler. And uh, Vichy had played this move h5, and well, well wait. Yeah, yeah, uh, queen b7. How is Vichy going to defend the pawn on g7? And Peter's comment was, uh, er, you know, like, er, you know, like. And then he looked at the monitor, and the players were shaking hands. And Peter went, uh, he's not. <laughs> queen g, queen b7, this pawn goes. So here, however, at least Vichy should have played queen to d2, uh, a move that really doesn't even deserve an exclamation mark, but with the idea at least of uh, putting pressure on f2. And after queen takes f3, queen takes c2, keeping the material balance even. Again, in this particular situation, uh, black uh, does not have to worry about this previous line of checkmate because he's got his own counterplay here, of course. So we would see the move king g2 as a prelude to this threat of check and queen over. And we would get this position. I actually thought 
that after king g8, of course I prefer white's position, there's no question about that, but at least if black could get to play h6 and rook g8, he puts up a, a fight, yeah? But uh, that wasn't to be h7, h5 cost the game. Magnus Carlsen won this game, and he went on to successfully defend his world championship. But again, it's just such, so cool to be you know, involved in the world of chess, to watch you know, the chess games when these world championship matches uh, happen. They are really something special, and I don't know. Uh, it was kind of funny, after this match was over, there was some like, um, uh, the uh, FIDE had said, the next world championship match is going to be in the United States. I was like, cool. So everybody called Tony Rich here at the St. Louis Chess Club and said, hey, can you confirm that we're going to host? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. We're not going to be uh, making a bid for the world championship match. But he got like, I'm not kidding, like 50 calls, you know, lots of messages because people inferred that if the world championship match was going to come to the United States, it would come to St. Louis. So that's, that's not... Uh, um, a, a bid that St. Louis has made or is planning to make, but if it does come to the United States, do make an effort to see a world championship match. They're special. Mm -hmm.